So as, as Matt mentioned, hi everyone. My name is Valery Karpov. I currently work as a kernel tools engineer for MongoDB, and I'm going to be talking to you guys about the mean stack and sort of providing you a high level introduction on what the terms are that you should sort of understand in order to get started with developing with the mean stack. So first of all, a little bit more about me. I'm not just some random guy on the internet. Um, so I started my career as the CTO of Scavenger back, in, back when I was 19 as a freshman in college. The, that company is now known as Level Up and is doing quite well. Um, since then, well, uh, since then I also coined the term mean stack in a blog post about a year ago. Um, my, the, uh, the blog post was based on my experiences working for a couple of startups, which I'll talk about in more detail a little bit later. Um, but basically, these were sort of uh, companies that came to me asking me to build out a full stack application for them. And well, I ended up selling on the mean stack because I thought, or what would later become the mean stack, because it was really freaking cool, new technologies, I wanted to play around with them. And so over the course of my time working with them, I came across several aha moments where I just realized, man, like web development used to be hard before this. Damn. <laughs> so yeah. So let me talk a little bit more about what the, what the mean stack actually is. Uh, for those of you who just aren't familiar with it, just get everyone on the same page. So it stands for MongoDB, ExpressJS, AngularJS, and Node.js. Now, MongoDB is a document database. Well, what does that mean? Well, uh, it seeks to sort of bridge the gap between a document store like Redis and a, uh, and a richly featured SQL database. So you get sort of the simplicity and elegance of storing objects as well as the performance of a Redis type solution with the, with the rich features, the aggregation, the incredibly complex queries that you can do with, uh, with a MySQL or a Postgres. Uh, ExpressJS is a Sinatra-based web framework on top of Node.js that provides simple routing features and the ability to sort of use the uh, use MVC-like terminology on your server with Node.js. And AngularJS, difficult to classify, but uh, it's a client-side model view controller MV, whatever you want to call the replacement for the C. Um, at a high level, what it provides is the glue between your server and your UI UX decisions. And Node.js, what we're all here for, event-driven I.O. and JavaScript is the tagline, but that is sort of, but that doesn't quite capture the, the depth of functionality that you can do with event-driven I.O. and JavaScript. So hopefully I'll show you a few more examples of cool things that you can do with Node. So uh, what is this talk going to be about? Well, I'm going to try to convince you guys that you should build your next web application, whether it be, uh, whether it be you know, your next weekend hack or something that you want to work on for your job, some task you want to automate. You should build that in the mean stack. That's what I think. Um, I don't, I'm not necessarily going to try to tell you to convert your existing applications to the mean stack. Not necessarily the right choice. Um, but the, so, what we're going to talk about is essentially what, uh, what could go wrong and what could be difficult with, uh, with building up a new web application. It should be easy, but often you run, into, you run into a lot of these difficulties. And as somebody who's built more web tools than I can reasonably count, uh, I have some background in this sort of thing, and I'd like to just share my experiences and help you guys understand how the Beanstack makes solving these problems much easier. So the problem categories when you're building a web application generally look something like this. Uh, you want, when you're building a prototype, we've all had those projects that end up getting mothballed after like six or eight months of work because the finish line doesn't seem to be getting any, anywhere closer. Um, adapting, when you've got the product out the door but the clients are clamoring for more functionality, the PMs want it and you just can't quite figure out how to get that to fit within the existing infrastructure. Testing. Testing a web application is difficult and a problem that hasn't quite been solved to my satisfaction yet. And well, the mean stack provides you with pretty good testing tools for both end-to-end -end and unit tests, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. And finally, scaling, or the best problem to ever have is 
people are using your application so much that you need to uh, that you need to expand across different machines, or you need to optimize your usage of a single machine. So I'll start off. We'll have sections for each of these, and I'll highlight sort of one or two problems and stories that I've had developing with the mean stack or not mean stack related to that particular issue. And I'll start off each one with a fun quote, keep things a little bit fresh. So when, when you want to build out a prototype, often you want to remember the Facebook developer mantra, done is better than perfect, which very accurate for Facebook because their product is very, very far from perfect. Um, but anyway, besides the point, the goal is to, get the, uh, is to get a product into your user's hands as quickly as humanly possible. Um, often that ends up being a challenge, and a lot of these tools were actually built by people who wanted to be able to ship products faster. As a matter of fact, AngularJS was actually built by my mentor when I was at, at Google. Um, he built it about a year after my summer internship, and he, uh, the reason why he why he just built out this tool was because he had a web UI that he wanted to build, but again, spent about eight months on it, wasn't getting anywhere, so he just decided to build a framework to do it, and then did it in a week. And another, another success story with the mean stack and prototyping effectively was the first startup that I was working on when I was, uh, when I sort of, when I was working on what became the mean stack. Was, uh, was a project called the Yascot Project. It was, a, it was a fun little fashion tech project. And we built it at a hackathon at Angel Hack in Washington, DC in 2012. We basically built the vast majority of the product in a day, released it the next week, and right while, uh, right while the investor interest was still hot, and we, and we started making revenue from day one. So we went from not having a GitHub repo to revenue in about four days, I think. Like, Something to that effect. And so in terms of prototyping, I think that's about as, as, about as good as we could have reasonably hoped. So what, uh, what about the mean stack makes it possible to build applications faster? Well, at the surface, having one language makes things easier just because you don't have to necessarily parse things uh, into what's going to happen in one language versus another. Your client is in JavaScript. You're not really going to change that anytime soon unless you develop the world's coolest new web browser. Hopefully, Dart will change that, but we'll see. Um, you have, the, uh, you have the, your server written in JavaScript, and then your database essentially stores JavaScript objects and has a nice little JavaScript shell that you can interact with. So everything is JavaScript. And personally, I love that because I think JavaScript is an exceptional language. Uh, package management. So NPM is freaking awesome. Very excellent tool. Uh, there's also Bower, which is sort of attached to NPM, which does NPM-like functionality for the client side, but just not quite as well. But a little bit deeper than that is uh, the mean stack sort of minimizes the amount of glue code that you need to glue the data coming from your database to your UI. And that was what saved us so much time. So what does that look like? So. AngularJS gives you the ability to sort of do what I like to call an interactive client-side template. Now, early days or templates in Rails or wherever you, uh, wherever you develop your server-side MVC apps in, basically, server generates an HTTP response that just contains this block of HTML, browser renders it, and then once it's shipped off, does it really change unless there's a little bit of jQuery finagling. With Angular, that's kind of turned on its head. And the HTML is served up to the browser with, uh, with all of the templating language already built in. And then Angular takes care of binding all of this data to the appropriate places. So essentially, Angular takes care of the templating. And the advantage of that is, well, when, uh, whenever your data changes on the client side due to client interaction, your, data, your UI updates to, uh, to reflect that almost instantaneously without having to reload the page. Now, so what this, is, what this is doing here is I have a simple little to-do list application that I will actually link to. It's on my GitHub. Um, so I'm going to put in a little bit of, type in my, uh, type in my you know, task name. I'm going to select a date, and I'm going to select, OK, go for it. And again, Angular updates all of this without me having to do any actual work. So there's the JSON object that you see. And that JSON object gets shipped as is to the server. 
the Node.js server gets exactly the same view of the data, except for it adds an underscore ID field for, uh, for MongoDB to track which document this actually is. And then MongoDB gets you the data pretty much as is, with, uh, with minor little modification with, again, the underscore ID field. So now, what is, what is, the, what is the advantage to this? Well, first of all, lower barrier to entry for new developers. Again, one language makes things simpler, one set of coding conventions, and one view of all of your data from the database all the way up to your client. The declarative UX is also extremely powerful. The, the difficulty of writing jQuery-based uh, JavaScript is that a lot of your uh, UX decisions start floating off into a magical, uh, into a separate JavaScript file. And, well, I, I don't know very many designers who are good at writing good, clean, organized JavaScript that they end up getting, digging themselves into a hole more often than not. And frankly, even I do when writing jQuery. It's not terribly easy to write it effectively. So Angular lets your HTML or Jade or whichever templating language you prefer be, uh, be your one true source of all UI UX decisions and write that all in a declarative syntax as opposed to having to write imperative each loops, or functional, but whatever you want to call it. And easier debugging, when all data looks the same, it's fairly easy to see, oh, okay, there's, okay, the server got the wrong data, must have been the client. And to some limited extent, you can reuse code, validation, enums, things like that. So that's why, uh, that's why prototyping is super easy. Let's take a look a little bit about adaptation, which is a fun subject, and we'll dig more into the node side of things. So a, co uh, a colleague of mine over at MongoDB once likened launching the first version of a product to, start, to arriving at the starting line of a marathon. Sure, you've taken like a two-hour bus ride to get to the middle of nowhere in Staten Island if you're running the New York Marathon, but, uh, but I mean, you, you're just getting started. So as Eddie Van Halen once very appropriately said, you're just at the beginning. Your application, well, your prototype will be simple and elegant, but ideally, if people are using it, there will always be somebody who wants one more thing, whether it be a product manager, business guy, uh, analytics guy, whatever. So common tasks that I've seen, um, bring in somebody who wants to start doing some intense number crunching on your, um, on your data set, and he can't deal with anything that's not Excel, so you have to give him an Excel dump every day. Um, or things like, okay, I want to be able to store a separate notification after everything, uh, after I finish serving up my HTTP response to the user, I just want to ship off a uh, notification that I did something into my database. Or I want to be able to do multiple HTTP requests in parallel. Simple things that seem simple, but they get to be complex because of locks and threads and concurrency being a bit of a difficult thing. So um, yeah, as, as you might have guessed, threads and locks are, are not very easy to work with, and they, uh, they cause a lot of opportunity for bugs, and they're difficult to test. And furthermore, cron jobs are a pain in the ass, too. They, uh, I, if I had a dollar for every time I got bitten by the bug where uh, cron jobs run under a different user, I, I, wouldn't, I would be a very rich man. So, but on the other hand, your server needs this sort of concurrency. You need to be able to do multi-threaded things. You need, to be you need to do things that are somewhat event-driven, and you need to be able to schedule things. And Node.js makes this extremely easy by virtue of being event-driven. There's no need to set up a cron job when you can just set a set timeout for how much time you need or set a set interval. And there's really no need for uh, there's really no need for multi-threading when everything is event-driven anyway, and you can use libraries like async to basically code in all of the logic that you need without a single lock. So here's a so best case scenario of what happens with uh, with Node.js and sort of adapting with concurrency. Um, me and my roommate a couple, about a year ago, decided we'd start doing some Bitcoin arbitrage back during that boom when Bitcoin went up from like 5 to 140 over the course of a week. That was a fun time. But there were about like 
$10 discrepancies between different exchanges. Mt. Gox was at 140, Camp BX was at like 130. Had a nice little opportunity to make some free cash, but, uh, but well, I had just quit my job at a high frequency trading firm and I was rather terrified because of the prospect of trying to build something like this because I knew people with all numbers of PhDs and degrees and more experience than I could ever possibly hope to have in the trading space, spending months upon months trying to churn out a, uh, a, a reasonable trading system. And well, I had just spent the last year and a half just working on you know, primarily market data feeds. And well, it was kind of depressing because I managed to do my, the job that I've been doing for an hour to, for like the last year and a half in about an hour because Node.js made it just trivially easy. I had a, I had a socket IO client pointing to a streaming Mt. Gox, uh, Mt. Gox's price feed, um, pinging a REST API every 15 seconds on the other hand, combine these two results, see if they're sufficiently different, okay, execute some trades. And with, within an hour, we were, uh, we were actually live trading, which just blew my mind. And then on top of that, we wanted to add a third exchange because we were like, oh, this is really easy. And then 15 minutes later, we had a third exchange and doing some arbitrage there. So made life very easy. So that's what, uh, so that's what you can do with, uh, with Node. Let's talk about a little bit about testing and the, the necessity to ex actually execute your code, as Donald Knuth said. Again, even when code looks right, it rarely actually is. So how, how do you actually prove that your code works? It's a tricky proposition and one that doesn't necessarily have the right, uh, right answer in, um, in web development world, especially when you start shipping things or when you start having interactive JavaScript on the client side. But, at one, but one place where we did something very well was at Bookalocal, which was the second startup that I was working on with, uh, with a mean stack application. So we, so we launched our official product around middle of August last year, and it was actually probably the most painless launch I have ever seen in my entire life. I mean, we were sitting there expecting everything to just be completely haywire and users to start you know, complaining and blowing up. But we ran into one bug, which we knew was actually a bug and decided to release anyway, because we were hoping that it would rear its ugly head. But everything else just Server just pretty much sat there for a week. We pushed some, we, we just kept pushing code and everything just kept on working and clients pretty much were like, yeah, okay, everything's working fine for the most part, except for one person who decided to call us because she thought our login was broken. It turns out she was entering her full name as opposed to her email, even though the login set to use her email. But that's life. And so for, and I credit the success of that launch primarily to our, uh, to our testing abilities and sort of our f fairly rigid, but not by any means perfect set setup of unit tests and end to end tests. And in some room, and well, not continuous integration yet, but so if you were, uh, if you were somebody who was just hadn't heard of testing your code, these are sort of like some of the steps that you might go through in sort of coming to today's conclusion of how to test your code. So when, so when you start thinking about how to test your code, maybe you decide, okay, I'm just gonna like, you know, test all everything manually. I'm just gonna, you know, just go through, click on things and make sure that it does the right thing. But that quickly spirals out of control. Um, it's not productive to do that for a general site. How are you going to test all of Facebook's functionality by pointing and clicking. But on the other hand, you still need this because, well, um, again, your end user is going to be a human. They have to actually use the site too. And something that's usable by a machine, not necessarily usable by a human. You might start writing unit tests, which are great. Make sure your code is well organized, but they don't catch the places where bugs always happen, which is in the interaction between modules for, for the most part. Um, and then tests are great. They test the entire suite of your site through basically just automa automatically going to your homepage, clicking on a few buttons, making sure things do what they should do. But they often require expensive setup and are slow to run. So you wouldn't want to have to sit around waiting on the results to, uh, to then go on to your next task. Um, test runners can help you automate the, uh, the setup process, but don't solve the problem of it being too damn slow and taking up computing resources. So continuous integration, where you run your tests on every single commit across every single browser, 
is, uh, is the current answer to how that should actually work, is you commit your code, and you do some rudimentary tests before you commit, but when you push it, it runs all the tests through across your entire, uh, across your entire, well, every browser you support. And then you can very easily track, well, OK, this commit introduced this bug. I know what happened. So how do you do this with the, uh, how do you run through these tests with the mean stack? Well, very uh, manual testing, no different. Unit testing, on the other hand, in JavaScript, unit testing is very easy, very elegant. Might be a slightly controversial statement, but such is life. Uh, all of that comes down to the fact that dependency injection in JavaScript is completely trivial. Um, AngularJS has built in dependency injection. And while there are, count, there are a fair number of dependency injection modules for Node, I wrote my own because none of the ones did exactly what I wanted. Uh, it's called OmniDI. Just look it up. It stands for one more uh, node injector. Um, big fan of it. And highly recommend it, but you could also write your own. It's more of a one afternoon exercise as opposed to a sort of you know one month exercise like it might be in other languages. For end-to-end -end tests, you have right now is a library called Angular Dash Scenario. You might want um, Angular the or rather the Angular team is coming out with a replacement called Protractor. But for now, Angular Scenario does a pretty good job of doing what you want an end-to-end -end test to do in the web sense which is basically hijack an iframe that points to your uh, that points to your home page click on some links make sure do tests like okay click on this link make sure that uh, make sure you've navigated to this page and four divs of this type have shown up and <clears throat> to help automate the test or automate end to end tests and unit tests there's a tool called karma um, which you may have heard of. It's pretty freaking awesome. It's a test runner that essentially automates all of, these, uh, all of these tests for you. It can launch browsers, run your unit tests on any, uh, any browser you want. It's also tied into tools like, uh, tools like Node units for Node.js unit tests. So you can hijack PhantomJS and run this. Oh, I'm sorry. It, um, it used to be testacular. Yeah. Uh, to be fair, I do have, uh, I do actually still have a code base that, uh, that actually does still use Testacular. But uh, I, I actually do not understand why they changed that name. That was like my favorite name of, of any tool ever. <laughs> yeah, I know. But, but it gave, so, so Karma was originally called Testacular. Uh, combination portmanteau of test and spectacular, but uh, but of course naturally they subtitled or they gave it the caption the test runner with balls, and some people did, that did jibe well with some people apparently so they changed it to karma, um, but yeah so it's compatible with Jasmine for client side unit tests, Node unit for uh, for server side unit tests, and Angular scenario for uh, for your end to end tests so you can automate all that setup. And for continuous integration, I can't quite, I'm not going to quite go into all that detail. But, uh, but Karma integrates very easily with any CI of your choice, Jenkins, Travis, Semaphore. Um, I haven't tried Drone yet, but I would presume it would be pretty easy to integrate with Drone as well. So that's kind of all I have to say about how testing works. Let's talk about scalability, which is a fun subject, right? For engineers, scalability is awesome. We're going to scale to 100 million users and beyond. But well, word of caution, and probably, probably the slide that you don't want to read. But, uh, but well, scalability is beyond a certain point is mostly just a Maserati problem in the sense that it, when it's, it's a problem that's not really a problem when you have it. Because, well, if you've gotten to a stage where basically everybody in your company or all of your target audience is hammering your site at the same time, You've, uh, you've clearly done something right, and you probably have art mountains of VCs or internal people barging, knocking down your door trying to help you out with, your, uh, with the code base or trying to throw money at you. So for the most part, it's a problem that you don't necessarily have to worry about, because the, because the hardest part of scaling an application to having 100, or to hit it, having 100 million users every day is building an application that's so damn useful that 100 million people want to use it every single day. And 
If you want to read a little bit more about that, uh, this link, which will, again, this slide deck will be up on SlideShare, Twitter, and the Meetup post, um, is uh, moderately not safe for work. It's entitled very, uh, very appropriately, I'm going to scale my foot up your expletive. And it goes through a very, uh, very crass but philosophically interesting argument along these lines. So if you're interested in sort of uh, reading about more about that, check that post out. It's awesome. But the other, the other question that often gets wiped out in the question of does, uh, does Rails scale or does Meanstack scale or does blah, blah, blah scale is scale to what? But uh, as, the, as the previous, as the article that I linked to in the previous slide would say, um, well, saying that Rails doesn't scale is like complaining that your car doesn't go infinitely fast. No car goes infinitely fast, just like nothing is going to scale to infinity. But, uh, but the question is, how much, do you, how much load do you need to handle? And well, difficult to judge an exact number, but if I had to guess an order of magnitude, it would be like somewhere between 1,000 and 10,000 unique users a day, obviously completely dependent on your usage patterns and all these things. But mostly, just limit to a single machine and walk through sort of like the, the, uh, the very small set of mistakes that every, uh, that every new web developer, or almost every new web developer ends up making. So horror story from that was, uh, was when I was working on Scavenger, the precursor to level up. Our first big event was back in 2008, and I, I was 19 at the time. I had no idea what I was doing, and I thought SQL queries all took the same amount of time to execute, like a very smart person I was. Um, and what ended up happening there was, well, in an interesting design decision, you had to text start to our servers in order to start your text message-based scavenger hunt. So when we had a hunt of about 1,000 people, they all texted start at the same time, and the server just tipped over. Very, very, very unfortunate. And I'll walk you through sort of like uh, at a high level what happened there and what are some of the other mistakes that I've made in terms of scalability. So the, the, the first, the biggest key point overarching all web scalability is, uh, as I asked you for this one before, is, uh, is don't be Schlemiel the painter. Now, this is, uh, this is an old Yiddish joke that was first mentioned in the context of software by the author of the Joel on Software blog. Um, the joke goes something like this. So Schlemiel decides that he's going to get a job painting a road. And, um, and, but every day, he, he starts painting less and less and less. And his boss asks him, Mr. Shamil, what's going on? Are, are you working too hard? Or maybe, are you just getting lazy? Do you not like your job? And Shamil says, no, just the paint can keeps getting further and further away. So you don't want to do that. And how do you avoid doing that? Well, one, make bandwidth is like the most scarce thing that you possibly have as a web developer. And you need to make sure that you use it as effectively as humanly possible. Bandwidth to you from your server to your user is very, very scarce. So one, are you asking the browser to cache assets for as long as reasonably possible? Um, and, make, and again, are you minifying all of your stuff? Well, you could use Grunt to do that. But with, uh, with Meanstack and Node.js in particular, uh, Grunt uses a, uh, a JavaScript minifier called Uglify.js, which is just an NPM module that's floating around that you can plug into your code. So my, my preferred approach actually involves, uh, without minifying on the file system, just have your server minify your JavaScript on server startup. It doesn't take reasonably long and has a couple of distinct advantages. First being that your server will crash if your client-side JavaScript has a syntax error which is good because you don't want your server to start and start serving up garbage JavaScript to people. Well, and second approach and second benefit is that it, um, is that it loads or it lo minifies the JavaScript in memory and serves it up from memory, which as conveniently is number two, which is the other really, really scarce thing that you don't want to deal with is, uh, is reading from the hard drive. Hard drives are slow, extremely slow, especially on EC2, where they're basically just, it's not even an actual spinning disk drive. It's some weird network back drive that is subject to some internal network latencies. 
Now, if you actually had a spinning disk drive, the order of magnitude that you could expect for how many reads that you could do from that hard drive in a second is order of a thousand, which sounds like a lot, except for, you know, when uh, if somebody to load your home page, they need to do an SQL join that takes about, uh, that reads from the hard drive in three distinct places, and then also loads up a couple images from your server, and then your actual HTML file. Well, that adds up to six requests right there, and that means you've only got maybe like, what, 160 people who can actually hit your site in a second, which is not bad, but gets quickly worse the more content that you add onto your site. So big key is your database reading from the hard drive. And well, with MongoDB, not necessarily a problem, or not that much of a problem. Um, if, you're, if you're used to MySQL world or PostgreSQL world, you'll probably be using memcached as a caching service in front of your database. Not necessary, or not strictly necessary with MongoDB, because MongoDB is very, very aggressive with, uh, with basically putting as much into memory as it possibly can. As a matter of fact, if your data doesn't fit in memory, MongoDB will actually take up all available memory. Um, and well, some people think that's a problem, but on the other hand, if you have wasted memory, then you're wasting performance. And final points of what choked the, uh, the scavenger servers was, uh, was making sure that you don't choke up the CPU. Now, not necessarily a problem with Node.js, but if you're using Ruby and you have some long running read operation or an HTTP request, everything is backed up behind it if your server is single threaded. And obviously that's a huge disaster. And what happened to us was that, well, our, uh, our SQL queries were getting to be slow and backed up because of the hard drive. And that meant that all other requests were backed up behind it too. And that ended up, triggering a bunch of timeouts, overflowing some things somewhere, and making the server tip over. But with Node.js, this isn't a problem because everything is event-driven, so everything can sort of proceed according to plan, and if it doesn't have to read from the hard drive, then it doesn't. So that's, that's all I have on the, on the four topics of discussion, but I'd like to address like another little common criticism or point that's made, which is, People often ask, well, well, these are cool, hip, new technologies. That's awesome, but will they be obsolete in five years? And the answer is, well, realistically, I, I would actually kind of hope so. I would actually hope that sort of there's something new that comes out that replaces one or more of these tools that does things better. And well, fundamentally, the question comes down to web development is, very, is a pretty simple thing. We, all, we have a very simple structure for it. You, have, uh, you send an HTTP request to a server. You get a response back. That includes some JavaScript that adds some bells and whistles to what you sent back. But realistically, it's very straightforward. And all we're doing is sort of building up these abstractions and tools to work better within this existing framework. And if something comes out that's better, by God, I'd love to use it. But for now, I think that the, but there are, again, limitations that are sort of inherent in this particular, in the particular model of HTTP request, HTTP response, and inherent into the structure of the internet that sort of are covered, that I sort of covered in this particular talk. Now, and hopefully I've, shown you guys how you can sort of get through these problems with the mean stack and how it makes these problems a little bit more manageable and makes web development a little bit more fun. So that's all I have to say about that. Uh, thank you, thank you guys very much for listening. And uh, these slides will be up on the meetup and all of that, so don't worry too much about that. But thank you guys very much for listening. It was very much a pleasure.